everybody. My name is Jennifer Kaur. I'm the Executive Director of the Tennessee Historical Society. Today is the fourth lecture in our series, Tennessee 101, Reconstruction to the Present. Our guide through this part of Tennessee's history is Dr. Carol Busey. Dr. Busey is Davidson County Historian and Professor of History at Volunteer State University, State Community College, sorry. She's a much in-demand speaker on the topics of Tennessee history and women's history. And we're fortunate that she agreed to spend this much time with us. So um, go ahead, if you have questions throughout the presentation, if you'll put them in the Q&A box, we will monitor them. And then if you look in the chat, uh, Nikki, our program director has put some information in there for you, links that we might be referring to and ways to access material after our lecture is over. So Dr. Busey, if you wanna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much. I'm glad to see all of you here virtually again tonight and appreciate your attendance. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about something that some of you probably heard your parents talking about, which is the Great Depression the New Deal, and then finally World War II. So we've got a lot of territory to cover tonight as we uh, talk about how these national and international things seemed to uh, take over Tennessee. Now I have to say, I've got one small little technical glitch here. My computer does not seem to be wanting me to move my slides and I, there we go. Okay, I was thinking I was gonna have to back out and come back in, but it, it's awake now, sorry for that. But today we're gonna talk about the coming of the Great Depression in Tennessee and then what happened afterward. And here we've still got these regional rivalries. They have been here since the beginning of the state. They are alive and well. Right now in the, the 30s, now that we have come from the 20s into the 30s, the big regional rivalry is West Tennessee versus Middle Tennessee, Memphis versus Nashville, and the face of Memphis during this period is indeed Edward Crump, known as Boss Crump, who really has a lot of political power in Memphis and in West Tennessee, and in Nashville, the person that he wants to compete with, Mr. Crump, that is, wants to compete with is Luke Lee. They disagreed about several political issues. So here is Luke Lee. He's a rather highly respected person in Tennessee. He owned the Nashville newspaper. He had bought the Nashville American. He is the publisher of the Nashville newspaper. He was a former U.S. Senator. He volunteered for service in the Great War. He was a colonel and involved in an effort to capture the Kaiser. He's very well known in Nashville. He is, a, a, by all accounts, a very outgoing people person. And he and Crump generally support different candidates on every state issue. In other words, if one is for one candidate, the other one is pretty much guaranteed to be against it. Now, as you may recall from last week when we talked about the 20s, the governor through most of the 20s was indeed Austin P. The progressive governor is what many people re regard him as being. He had had two very successful terms. He had gotten road legislation, education bills, reform of the state government organizational plan. And now he's running for a third term in spite of the fact that his doctors advised him against it. He had a serious heart ailment, but he decides he is going to run for office anyway for that third term. And indeed he is elected. Unfortunately, he is only in office into his third term a few months when he has a massive coronary event and he dies in office. Now, the Constitution of Tennessee provides that in the case of a, a resignation or a death in the office of governor, or for that matter, an impeachment, which we've never removed a governor from office, but it, uh, the lieutenant governor becomes governor. The lieutenant governor, however, has only been elected to that position by the members of the Senate. He is the speaker of the Senate and he is a member of the Senate 
who was has been elected the speaker. So he has no real statewide uh, network of people that he can rely on, which certainly Austin P had a very strong political uh, support group in his favor. And Henry Horton just represents this one relatively small district part of Southern part of Middle Tennessee. So it is at this point that you see Luke Lee having a great deal of influence on Henry Horton. Luke Lee had been very close friends with Austin P, but now he has influence on Henry Horton. And Henry Horton does, I think, rely on Luke Lee for a lot of advice about what's going on. Now, in the 1928 election, Horton is going to run for the office of governor in his own right, and Edward Crump will not support him because Horton is supported by Luke Lee. So Crump supports the candidate Hill McAllister, who has been involved in several uh, activities related to state government, cabinet type positions, and he is supported by Crump. He is from Middle Tennessee, he is from Nashville, and he will get the support of Crump. So the issue here is Luke Lee's influence on Governor Horton, which Mr. Crump thinks is way too much, that he gives advice to Governor Horton on lots of different subjects. And who is going to get the support of McAllister? Mr. Crump. Horton won. In other words, the voters of the rest of the state decided to go with Nashville's support of Henry Horton rather than Memphis and Mr. Crump's support of Hill McAllister. So that's 1928 and the economy, uh, not only of Tennessee, at least the banking part of the economy really seems to be booming. This is when the stock market in New York City is going up, up, up. And so in this election, Herbert Hoover, the Republican candidate is elected president and he, he gets, he makes some statements that we have just about abolished poverty. We'll never have any poverty again. Look at the wealth our country has. It's interesting to look at the areas that voted for Hoover and the areas that voted for Al Smith. Let's look at this map here. Note where Tennessee cast its votes for Herbert Hoover. We always had this very strong Republican Party in East Tennessee, and in this particular election, Horton uh, Hoover carried the state. And here is Al Smith, who seems to be kind of an unlikely candidate for the Solid South to be voting for because he did not support prohibition. He was a Catholic, and yet the Southern states voted for. Al Smith, who did not win the election. So the economy is booming and Hoover thinks that it's Republican prosperity because we had had, now he is the third pro Republican president in a row here. Now, let's look at the business community of Nashville and what is thriving in Nashville and what is thriving is Caldwell and Company. It is a holding company established about 1919, 1917, somewhere in that period around World War I by Rogers Caldwell. Rogers Caldwell was the son of a very well-known baker here. And he established this company to sell municipal bonds specifically to a Southern market. A lot of people who were in the bond business did not want to sell to Southern municipalities because Southerners already had a reputation for defaulting on some of these bonds that were issued and they did not want to deal with Southerners for fear that there would be that default on these bonds. But his business grew unbelievably fast. He has capital from people who, who will put this money into these bonds with the idea that it will be spent later. And so the firm grows and it becomes the largest banking, uh, uh, investment banking company in the South. And then 
that's in 1930 and then it is going to have a fall. So he had invested in these bonds that were handling uh, all manner of electrical uh, grids and, and things related to uh, industry and southern, southern infrastructure projects. The market is booming and then boom. The market crashes and people think it's not going to last, but it in fact does. Now Crump Boss Crump really dislikes Luke Lee, partly because of prohibition, partly because he has too much influence on uh, the, the governor, Henry Horton, and partly, I think, because Luke Lee was involved in several business dealings with Caldwell and Company. They didn't work together all the time, but they worked together some of the time. And Luke Lee has interests in several newspapers across the state. They work together. And of course, the state's got to deposit its money somewhere. And the state of Tennessee will deposit its money in the Bank of Tennessee. The Bank of Tennessee had been started, been founded by Rogers Caldwell. Mr. Crump does not like Mr. Lee. Prohibition is one of the many reasons why. And Mr. Crump, what he wanted was really quite simple. He just wanted to get the fair share of the state dollars over to Memphis. He felt like too much state money was being spent in Nashville and Memphis needed its fair share. So after Hill McAllister, Mr. Crump's candidate for governor, loses in 1928, he, Mr. Crump, is ready to make a deal with Horton. And in some ways, he thinks he's probably making it with Luke Lee as well. So when the next election comes along and Henry Horton's going to run again for governor, this time, irony of irony, Mr. Crump supports Governor Horton and he wins. Now here, the chronology and the dates are really important. He wins the election on November 4th, a year after the stock market crashed. November 8th, four days later, the Bank of Tennessee failed. The state lost in that failure over $3 million. And before the end of the year comes, the state has lost over $6 million in Caldwell and Company banks. Now, needless to say, Mr. Crump is not going to be a supporter of Henry Horton very long. And so before the legislature even gets back to town in, in January, Mr. Crump and a lot of other Tennessee politicians are calling for Henry Horton to be impeached, to be removed from office. And so Henry Horton says this is just a horrible thing that, that has happened, but he wins one day and then the bottom falls out and people are wanting to remove him within a week's time. So the Democrats come back together uh, for this uh, uh, impeachment trial. Henry Horton is, is not removed from office. He stays in office, but his political career is over. So Hill McAllister will indeed get elected governor in the next election, and he will succeed Henry Horton as the governor of the state of Tennessee. So we've had various people in the administration. There is some continuity uh, always in state government through, through various administrations. And Luke Lee is more or less out of the picture now. Lee won't support any of these people this time, including Henry Horton instead. He supports 
Malcolm Patterson, who we thought was gone from the political scene, he had been the governor at the time that Senator Carmack was shot in 1908, and he's now running for governor again with the support of Luke Lee. So Hill McAllister won that election and said the voters had been tricked in the 1930 elections. Hill McAllister has the good fortune of running also at the time when Franklin Roosevelt is running for president. By 1932, uh, the country has really made an about face about President Herbert Hoover. They are ready to get rid of him. Anybody but Herbert Hoover seemed to be the theme. The Democrats could nominate almost anybody. And as you see here, the country overwhelmingly went for Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was, had been governor of New York, but he was a person that people didn't know a lot about nationwide. And so he, he did not seem like a person who could really pull this country out of the depression. But the thing that he had going for him, I suppose I would call it the power of positive thinking. And indeed, his optimism really went a long way. So he will in, usher in a series of programs to try to pull the United States up out of the depression and get the economy going again. Okay, the stock market crashed. Tennessee is overwhelmingly agricultural. Tennessee's farmers have been hurting. I've talked about this here before. There are lots of people that are hurting now in addition to the farmers. Banks are having problems. Banks are closing right and left, runs on the banks. We've got lots more unemployed people than we can handle in the state of Tennessee. Uh, there is a, a limited amount of jobs and the jobs seem to dry up regularly. One of the very poorest parts of the United States is that area of the Tennessee River Valley. And that's a very vast area but poverty really is very pervasive in many of the towns on the tributaries of the Tennessee River, as well as the Tennessee River itself. And these unemployed laborers have, have skills and know where to put their skills to use. There's a run on American Planners Bank, there are runs on the bank, Hermitage Bank in Nashville, and the Saudi bank in over in East Tennessee completely fails in 1930. So banks are in a heap of trouble. And as a result of this, Hill McAllister, who's sworn in in January, Franklin Roosevelt won't be sworn in until March the 4th of 1933, because the banks are falling so rapidly. Hill McAllister, declares a banking holiday in Tennessee before Franklin Roosevelt takes the oath of office and becomes president and then declares a nationwide banking holiday. But the purpose is to keep the rest of the banks from not folding, from not becoming insolvent. And that was the purpose. Now, Franklin Roosevelt gets in the White House and he has all along been a little bit vague about what he was going to do. But this is where he was very consistent as a campaigner. He said, we're going to try something. And we'll, if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. And if that doesn't work, we'll keep trying. But we're going to try some new things and see if we can get our economy rolling. And so, of course, I love this cartoon because Congress may want it to roll, but not quite as fast as Franklin Roosevelt does. And keep in mind, there are so many cartoons that portray President Roosevelt as this robust, muscular, athletic man when we all know that he had polio and was heavily paralyzed from the waist down. But he gets some help in Congress from some folks from Tennessee. Joseph Wellington Byrne had been a con congressman from the district that was Davidson County and Robertson County. And he, would been, uh, he had been elected Speaker of the House. He has a great deal of power and he can shepherd those New Deal bills as this package of Franklin Roosevelt, all these trial things he's gonna try 
are lumped together and called the New Deal. But it wasn't a planned out program. The New Deal was not. So Joe Burns will be instrumental in getting the votes on the floor of the House for these various bills. And in the Senate, we have Senator Kenneth McKellar, who has a great deal of clout and respect in the Senate. And he is an important figure in getting the New Deal legislation passed by the Senate so that President Roosevelt can indeed sign it. The farmers have been in trouble since the Civil War. In a nutshell, overproduction, underconsumption. The more they produce, the lower the price goes. The lower the price goes, they try to produce more, the lower the price goes. You've seen this chart from me before, but it was continuously going down and there's enormous surpluses around the state that often are just laying fallow and going to waste or rot. The soil is bad. The living conditions are bad. People who have borrowed money to buy additional farmland are having the banks foreclose on their land. Now, the banks foreclose on the land, but the banks don't have any money themselves. So it'll be a while before the banks can, can have people buying these lands. So people are leaving. They're packing up in some cases, heading out to anywhere, Oklahoma, Arizona, California, people will be leaving the state when they have nothing else to do. And can you imagine this school teacher teaching here? She's got a few children in this school. You've got an oil can for a heater there. People are living in farms all in poverty. They are not making ends meet. So one of the earliest programs that Congress passes is a bill to help the farmers known as the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And what are they going to adjust related to farming? They are going to reduce the amount of acreage in which a particular agricultural product is produced. In other words, if you were planting 100 acres of cotton, perhaps you should cut that down to 60 or 75 acres. In other words, reduce production with the idea that when you reduce production, the price per pound of, of cotton or other commodities will indeed go up. And so the farmers are really so desperate, they're willing to try anything. And they really do initially sign on to this program. You have to sign a contract that you will produce less. But then when things don't get better, some of the farmers become a little bit uh, distressed about this. And, you know, there are some things here that are just sort of counterintuitive for farmers. You've had a sow who has a litter of 10 or 12 pigs, but the only way you're going to reduce the number of hogs on the market is to get rid of, meaning killing, uh, the, uh, the surplus of little pigs. So you might keep two or three for the market in a litter that had 10 or 12 little pigs in it. So that was a pretty hard thing for farmers to do. Now, the farmers are trying the AAA, Agricultural Adjustment Act programs, and they are trying to be optimistic and comply. And by the way, the government is providing some subsidies for farmers for the land that is laying fallow. So it's not like they are not getting anything from the government in return for this. They are getting some allowance, a cash allowances uh, because they are in this program. And there are all sorts of subsidies on agricultural products today and regulations as well. Now, in a society, what group of people usually get into trouble the most, the fastest, when they don't have enough to do? Young men. Men who are 18, 19, 20, 21, that age young men, if they don't have a job, they might get into mischief doing some things to take the law into their own hands. So Congress and President Roosevelt recognized the, the challenge of these folks. 
And what is passed is a bill to create a jobs program for these young men that is going to be called the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. It is run like an army. It's a corps. You wear a uniform. You get up at a certain time. You go to bed at a certain time and you work all day. You are civilians, however. And where are you going to work? You are going to work in conservation. You're going to work in the forest, on the roadsides, in what are state parks. You are going to be working across Tennessee and in some cases other parts of the South. Now, there are a few people still around who are what I would call the alumni of the Con Con Civilian Conservation Corps. There are very few of these men left, but they every man that I ever spoke to who had been in the CCC said it was the best experience of his life. And as a result of that, he became, uh, he developed a tree cutting business or he, he had a nursery, he raised plants. But many of these jobs were the, the jobs that the government was providing turn into real jobs after the CCC goes, uh, uh, closes in, in the late thirties. Now, I think one word about the CCC, and this is generally true of the, all of the New Deal programs, they were segregated. Franklin Roosevelt may have thought that it would be a good idea to integrate these, certainly his wife Eleanor did, but Franklin Roosevelt had to have the support of Southern congressmen, and he knew that Southern congressmen would never approve any bill that had any form of integrated activity in it, including the CCC. So there are camps built around the state. Tennessee ended up having a good number of these camps. These young men live in tents and they get a paycheck, but about three fourths of that paycheck is sent home to their parents. And the parents love it because no longer are they having to feed these young men, keep them clothed, uh, worry about them all the time. Now they are doing something productive and will be watched and be able to stay out of trouble. Now look at this map and it may be a little hard to see on your computer screen, but these the little dots are where the CCC camps were in 1938. Looking here at Tennessee, you see lots of camps over here in the Smoky Mountains, over here in West Tennessee. Hmm, not so many right here in Middle Tennessee. I think West Tennessee has got some influence uh, on, on where these CCC camps are put. And certainly Mr. Crump felt that he had a say in where most federal programs of the New Deal were put in the state of Tennessee. Now look at Kentucky. Kentucky has fewer than Tennessee, but Kentucky has some. Look at these statistics. I think this tells you quite a lot. Tennessee had 6,600 men in 33 camps while Kentucky had only 3,400 men. And look at the sites the Tennessee young men are working on. National forests, national parks, federal reservations, state forests, private land, erosion, flood control, roads, you name it, the Tennessee legislative delegation is responsible for this. They made sure that Tennessee got its fair share and sometimes a little above. If you go over to Montgomery Bell, it's not very far from Nashville. It's about, oh, maybe 20 miles West of Nashville is about, I don't know, maybe 150 east of Memphis. But if you go over to the Montgomery Bell State Park, they've recently put up this monument to their Civilian Conservation Corps heritage. And they've put up some really attractive signage there. And, and they want to claim the legacy of what the Civilian Conservation Corps did in clearing the trails for the trails that are in Montgomery Bell State Park. Now the African-American CCC recruited here in Tennessee as well. This crew is working on clearing brush from the side of a road and, and they are working as well, but they are completely separate. The CCC has over the years had reunions up at Pickett State Park. 
if you haven't been there, it's sort of towards the Cumberland Plateau. Here is a photo of one of the reunions at the Pickett State Park. I don't think they've had one in several years. And they're the veterans of the CCC are there. There are very few of them that are still alive. Now let's look at that massive poverty problem. The people who live in the Tennessee River Valley. Why were they chosen for this project? because they were so much in need. The Tennessee River, I've heard one historian of the Tennessee River call it a flashy river because it had all sorts of turns and it had places where it went down, it narrowed, it widened, it had these shoals. It was quite a difficult river. It often flooded. There was tremendous soil erosion on either side of the river. It was practically impossible to take a boat of any kind almost from Knoxville to down through the Muscle Shoals and then up to the Ohio River. It was almost impossible to make that length of the Tennessee River in a boat, especially if the water wasn't incredibly high because it was such a difficult journey. And so Congress and the person behind this is not somebody from Tennessee this time. It is Senator George Norris, who is from Nebraska. But he has had this idea of creating a valley authority, not the river authority, but the valley. So he's focused on the land. What's going to make the land better and raise the poverty rate? Right? in the land. So it's going to be a comprehensive program. It's regional planning. It is employment. It is uh, conservation control as well. It has all of these components in it, and it is going to go for the Tennessee River Valley. And if this is successful, regional planning, then they'll start building other river authorities, the Colorado River Authority, the Missouri River Authority, the Connecticut River Authority. There will be other authorities based on the pattern of the TVA. So why did those others never get created? Well, part of it was because World War II came along, but there was one federal agency group that was very unhappy with President Roosevelt for creating this separate government entity, the TVA. They thought that rivers was the responsibility of them, them being the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They had been responsible for the rivers all of these years. The Corps of Engineers was an elite group. Many of these people had graduated from West Point. Uh, one person in the Corps of Engineers was Robert E. Lee. But these engineers felt that that money going to this separate agency should have been given to the Army Corps of Engineers. But Roosevelt was firm about this. This is a regional planning, and that is outside the purview of the Army Corps of Engineers. So they're going to do something about all of this poverty. Now, in addition to the Corps of Engineers being upset, there are also people who have lived on this property for multiple generations. Their family is buried there. They just don't want to leave no matter what the government pays them. And so the laws of condemnation are applied and many people are unwilling or are, are unwillingly moved off of their homeland where their generations of family had lived. Now, I have never seen this, but I have had people tell me that if you go over to Lake Watauga, especially in East Tennessee, when it's a perfectly clear day, no haze, no smoke, and no wind so that the water is very calm, if you go out in a boat on that lake, you can look down and see houses, barns, buildings 
that were in the wake of the damming and the creating the lakes uh, as part of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Cemeteries were moved, but others were just, the, when the dams opened, they were flooded. So pay attention to this map. You know I like maps a lot. And I think this is an important part for those of us who live in Middle Tennessee here, because note, that this whole area of Middle Tennessee is in the Cumberland River Valley, not the Tennessee River Valley. So we were excluded. The people in Gallatin really, really wanted the TVA to take over the Cumberland River because there were times in, in the summer when the river got so low that a ferry couldn't go across from Sumner County over to Wilson County. So they wanted the TVA, but their congressmen was not, were not able to get Roosevelt to change his mind about this regional planning project for just the Tennessee River watershed. So they have all manner of programs for their employees. They build houses uh, for their employees and their families. They build little communities for these folks. They have, they have a library, they have schools, they have all manner of things. And look at the complexity of this building. And keep in mind, this is really before the TVA dams were built, before uh, the uh, uh, safety regulations that the federal government now puts on all building sites. Here are the workers who were building Norris Dam, the first one that will go online, named in honor of Senator George Norris. There he stands. It's a beautiful site. It's up above Oak Ridge in, in that area. It's, it's really pretty countryside. They have a museum there as well. And Franklin Roosevelt came and visited as always with a smile on his face. You never knew that he really could walk. And I've always wondered who this little boy might have been in this picture and what he told his grandchildren when he grew up and had a family of his own. But meeting Franklin Roosevelt was quite an experience. Old Hickory Dam won't be built till after World War II and it will be built by the Corps of Engineers as Percy Priest Dam on, on the Stones River. And following the TVA, which is going to produce cheap electricity with these dams, some of the dams, the Rural Electrification Administration follows, running electrical lines back in these hollows and places that are too far for a private electrical company to run a line. The private electrical companies really oppose the TVA themselves. They really did not like this because what they saw it doing was selling the commodity, the product, electricity, and undercutting their market, and it was going to put them out of business. And you know, you hear from time to time somebody wants to talk about privatizing the TVA, and that idea generally comes and it goes as well. The Works Progress Administration was an important agency here in Tennessee and did a tremendous amount of work, including building what is now the Metropolitan Nashville Davidson County Courthouse. Uh, it housed both the county government and the city government, which were separate in the 1930s when this building was built, and it was a, to replace an older building. There are murals in the Metro Courthouse uh, that were done by unemployed WPA artists. There were unemployed writers for the WPA who did things like go out and, and do cemetery records, records of the tombstones. They did a very important set of interviews of people who had been former enslaved people. Little did they know that 10 years before, or if they knew they didn't pay any attention to it, they, they didn't know that Fisk had done its own set of these similar interviews 10 years before. But we have these two sets of interviews, one done by Fisk professors and students, and one done by the white writers working for the WPA. There is a stark difference between the two sets of interviews and, and the way that they are written. They also, the WPA artists painted murals 
in post offices. There are several around Tennessee. Many of them have been long since gone, but there's still one in Lexington over in West Tennessee and in Dixon over close to Montgomery Bell State Park. The WPA builds buildings and bridges in our state parks and they are successful. Another project that is, is pretty successful but doesn't expand beyond the, the two projects that were created was a homesteading project. Whereas the federal government built and, and with the assistance of the people that are gonna live in them, these homestead houses, Crossville had a community of these, they have a museum. You can tour some of the houses, but people are living now. Some of these have been re renovated up at Crossville and are really quite attractive houses. But you know, as well as I, what ultimately pulled Tennessee out of the depression, the coming of World War II. Now the war started in Europe between Germany against France and Great Britain and then the Soviet Union. And then Japan went to war with China. There are lots of people in Tennessee and the United States who say, stay out of the war, stay out of the war. It was a mistake for us to get pulled into the other world war. We need to stay out of it. So Tennesseans are pretty quick to take sides here as to whether we should help our allies, the British and French out. Of course, Winston Churchill is lobbying Franklin Roosevelt as hard as he can to do that. But the country is divided. The probably the biggest, most effective spokesman against the war, against US getting involved in any way, meaning selling things or anything was none other than Charles Lindbergh, the pilot. He was an American hero and he was the head of this America First Committee. And it drew a lot of support around the country. One of the ministers here in Middle Tennessee who preached about his opposition to the war was the minister of the First Presbyterian Church in downtown Nashville. He thought that the United States should indeed stay out of the war. Now, our governor by this time, by 1939, is Prentice Cooper. Prentice Cooper had, was a member of the Rotary Club, and he had gone to Germany on a Rotary Club tour and was stunned at what he saw. Whereas we had the CCC, the Civilians Conservation Corps, the Germans had the Nazi Youth Corps. And he was really shocked at how military buildup was running Germany. In other words, the German military buildup, he knew that war was coming before Germany invaded Poland and France went to war and so on and so forth. So Prentice Cooper comes back to Tennessee and when he gets elected governor, Tennessee starts getting prepared. And Tennessee really was prepared when Pearl Harbor was attacked because we had kind of been through this once before uh, with the Great War and now we're going to do it again. And so Tennessee counties have alert systems, they have all manner of things. And at the point of Pearl Harbor, we didn't really know whether there were going to be an invasion of the United States or not. So Tennesseans enlist in great numbers. They go off to be trained. Women enlist in the Army Corps, the waves. There are jobs for everybody. Tennessee gets its share of military camps. Some of these camps were already here. Millington Naval Base, a naval base on the Mississippi River, an airfield. Uh, we've got Camp Tyson, which builds these large balloons. Uh, we've got camps everywhere. The big story of the military in Tennessee, however, is when the second army led by none other than General George Patton comes to Middle Tennessee. Why has the second army come? They have come to practice getting ready for the invasion of, of Europe to liberate France and then take Germany to win the war. And so they have come here and they are practicing all over Middle Tennessee, Sumner County, Wilson County, Rutherford County, uh, and that whole region there, they are practicing. And General Patton has his office set up at 
Cumberland University. And these war games are really kind of a spectacle, a spectacle sport. Uh, they have these tanks, which are just such a novelty for people to see. People love to watch these. There was a terrible tank accident on the Cumberland River when one of these tanks that they had built a pontoon bridge, a bridge that floats, and one of these pontoon bridges, uh, uh, one a, a, a tank was going across the bridge there about where Hendersonville is, and it went off of the bridge and the men inside the tank all, all died. They could not get out. But this boosted the economy. They came into town, they bought candy, they bought cigarettes, they went to the movies, they spent money, and people loved having all of this action here. Not that different looking from the CCC, except for the tanks and the weaponry. People enjoyed having the soldiers around. Meanwhile, we have jobs for women galore, the Volte Air, Air Factory is going to start producing planes at an unprecedented rate. Women are now given these industrial jobs. Rosie the Ritterfurter lived in Tennessee. Another Tennessean that deserves a lot of credit here and recognition is Dinah Shore, a singer who had come to Hume Fogg High School and then to Vanderbilt, and she went out and sold war bonds. She made records. She performed for troops. One of her hits was with the Benny Goodman Orchestra playing and she singing, My Guys Come Back. What every woman who had a husband or boyfriend or brother in the war wanted to happen, wanted them to come back. The highest grossing movie in 1941 is none other than Sergeant York. Let's rally people around a hero from World War I. Gary Cooper won Best Actor for his performance in Sergeant York. There are several POW camps in Tennessee, one in Cookville, the Cookville, Crossville area, Clarksville, down close to Lawrenceburg. And in many cases, these POWs were allowed to go out and work for farmers since many farm boys were off in the war and they became friends with the families and communicated for many years. Another person here in Tennessee that is a heroine of the war is Cornelia Ford. She grew up in a very wealthy family in Nashville. She wanted to be a pilot. She finally convinced her parents to allow her to take pilot flying lessons. She had gone from Nashville to Sarah Lawrence College in New York City, and she became a pilot. And during the war, she was a civilian pilot who flew planes back and across the United States from one coast to the other, transporting the plane, and in some cases, transporting the uh, goods that the army needed from one coast to the other. There was a, a core of women pilots during the war. And she was killed eventually in a training accident, which uh, really devastated uh, all of Tennessee when they heard that Cornelia Ford had been killed. She had witnessed the attack on Pearl Harbor because she was up in a plane that day teaching another person, a young man, how to fly. She was giving a flying lesson and she was afraid she wasn't going to get back. But she lived for, to land her plane safely and, and come back to Tennessee and fly more, many more, more missions for the government. Uh, but she was killed in a training accident. Now, Anderson County, it was rural beyond rural, not very big, hard to kind of get to. And Governor Cooper finds out that the federal government is buying up huge blocks of land in Anderson County. Well, why hasn't the federal government notified the governor of the state of Tennessee? What secret project is being developed? The Oak Ridge National Laboratories, as a result of this letter sent by Albert Einstein, a physicist who had escaped Germany to England and then to New York. 
he sends this letter to President Roosevelt saying, the Germans are developing a super bomb in which they split an atom. It is going to be the most powerful. The United States needs to develop it before the Germans develop this bomb. And so President Roosevelt brings in the Army Corps of Engineers. They create this Manhattan Project. Pieces of the pro program, the bomb, will be made at different uh, laboratories across the country. And Oak Ridge was picked because it had these ridges where if there was any kind of fallout accident, it wouldn't go up very high. And also because they had plenty of electricity now, thank you, Tennessee Valley Authority. So here are the labs, Chicago, Oak Ridge, Hartford, Washington, Los Alamos, New Mexico. And when the components of the bomb at Oak Ridge are finally, finally finished, and it took several years for this to develop, there is Oak Ridge, when it is finally finished, it is carried to Los Alamos by an army officer in a suitcase. They test the bomb and it worked. And by this point, president, uh, the president is Harry Truman and he gives the okay for the bomb to be dropped at Hiroshima. And then when the Japanese don't surrender after that, it is dropped at Nagasaki, thus ending the war. A secret society, you could, you, they hired young women from all over the country, but you could not even tell the people you lived in the dorm with what your job was. You could not talk about your job at all. It was an amazing thing. There is a wonderful museum up there and it's a great place to take uh, your family. Uh, it's got a lot of scientific information and they will give you a tour, but you have to be on a bus with them. You can't drive around the site. It's high security even today. But here you see these people didn't even know what they were working on for sure until the war ended. So now the war has ended. What's coming next? Well, uh, these African-Americans who have willingly enlisted in the army, they have served their country. They are not gonna come back to Tennessee and accept second-class citizenship anymore. They are going to demand their rights as Americans. And so what is gonna follow is a great deal of change. Mr. Crump is going to lose control of politics, but there will always be somebody trying to control politics, I think, here in Tennessee, or influence. Maybe control is too strong a word, but influence politics. You go down to the legislature, to the Capitol, when the legislature is in session, and the halls are packed with people wanting to influence politics. So if you have anything to add to this, please let us hear from you. Uh, last week, uh, one of you sent me an email about the fact that John T. Scopes had actually spoken at Peabody. And, and I looked it up and found, yes, he did speak at Peabody in April, 1970. So I've put an, a link to an article about his visit to Peabody and what he said up on Padlet. And I think you'll find the article very interesting to read. So here is my email address. A few people were unable to reach me last week, but you got to remember my mother put that E on the end of Carol. And so you have to put that E there too. And Busey is uh, four little letters, not B-U-C-E-Y. I want to once again reiterate our great thanks to Humanities Tennessee for making this series possible. We have enjoyed the partnership with the Humanities Tennessee. And by the feedback we've gotten from many of you, we know that you greatly have appreciated these two. And we are delighted to be able to offer these classes 